we're lucky to have two speakers with us today during this session. Um, first off, we'll have Carrie Tanzi, who works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Michigan's Ecological Services Field Office uh, in East Lansing, which is close to me. Uh, Carrie has 12 years of experience working with endangered species in Michigan. Uh, she has a master's of science degree from Clemson University and a bachelor of science degree from Grand Valley State University. Uh, today, she's going to talk with us about a little known endangered aquatic beetle who lives in some of our rivers and streams. And then following Carrie, uh, Emily Burke will be speaking with us. She is the conservation and education specialist for the Grass River Natural Area in Antrim County, where she directs monitoring, restoration, <clears throat> and citizen science projects um, for the Grass River Natural Area's 1,492 acres, um, and then educates people on the natural history of Northern Michigan there. She graduated from Duke University with a degree in evolutionary and anthropo anthropology and biology and holds a, a master's degree in environmental education from Southern Oregon University. And she's gonna talk with us about um, the invasive species, uh, New Zealand mud snail, which Joe mentioned a little bit this morning, which was detected as part of their volunteer stream monitoring program. And with that, Carrie, if you wanna share your screen, um, we'll make sure it gets up it's up there all right. Okay, let's see. I can hear you and see you. Okay. Let's see you here. Okay. Everyone can see my screen okay? It's perfect. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. So um so thank you. Uh first of all for can I, um, can you see the, this screen to a camera? Um, the, can, nope, we can just see can just, your okay, presentation perfect. screen okay, the way you want you. it. <laughs> All right. So, um, so thanks everyone for um, being here to, to listen a little bit about the federal endangered hunger fruits crawling water beetle. I'm really excited to be here. I, I appreciate the invite, Tamara. Um, as, as Tamara mentioned, I work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We are a, a federal agency within the Department of Interior, and we're the primary agency responsible for implementation of the Federal Endangered Species Act, as well as other federal wildlife um, laws. And I'm not sure how many of you knew before today that we have an endangered crawling water beetle in Michigan. But this is one of my favorite Michigan species. Um, it's probably the least well-known of our, of our federally listed species in Michigan. Um, so this is Hungerford's crawling water beetle or Berkeus hungerfordi. Um, and just to give you a sense of kind of what you're looking at in this picture, this is a, a paintbrush that we use to sort of sort our, our, our um, macroinvertebrates just to give you a sense of scale. My hope for today's presentation is to give you some background on the species and where they occur in Michigan with my ultimate goal of having some of you hopefully discover some new populations of this species in Michigan. So Hungerford's crawling water beetle is a member of the Holiplidae family. Uh, so order Coleoptera, family is Holiplidae. And the Holiplids are, or, or crawling, the crawling water beetles or Holiplids are um, fully aquatic. So all active life stages are spent in the water. The adults are small, about four millimeters in length on average, and they have a distinctive elongated and streamlined body shape. So they're adapted for crawling around in the water and, and swimming in, in current. Um, and so you can see the, um, the kind of the distinctive features of the adults, and we'll talk about this more in a few slides. But they're yellowish brown in color. Um, this is Brickius hungerfordi on the right here. They have irregular dark um, blotches. You can see these black blotches. And they also have these longitudinal stripes on the elytra, which are the hardened outer wings of the beetle. And so those longitudinal stripes are made up of um, a series of fine, closely spaced, and darkly pigmented indentations. Um, and then on the left, you can see the larva 
for Hungerford's calling water beetle. Um, they are also light yellowish brown. Um, they have cylindrical bodies that taper to a hooked tail. Um, they're stiff bodied and they possess uh, short legs with five segments and a single tarsal um, and single tarsal hooks. And we're gonna, again, we're gonna talk about the uh, identifying features for this species in a few slides. So the species was listed, listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act as an endangered species in 1994. It's also um, listed as endangered under Part 365, which is the State of Michigan Threatened and Endangered Species Statute. And, it, and it's also endangered um, status in Ontario, Canada. So this map shows the range-wide distribution of Hungerford's crawling water beetle. So they're found in Northern Michigan and Ontario, Canada. And this map um, has point locations uh, of, of streams where Hungerfords is known to occur, and they're labeled with the year of discovery. Um, so the locations that were known at the time of listing in 1994 are circled. So if, if it's too small for you to see, um, there, are, there were three known populations at the time the species was listed in 1994, um, two in Northern Michigan, and then one in Ontario, Canada. Since the time of listing, we've discovered an additional 10 um, locations where this species occurs. So now we have a total of 13 known populations um, throughout its range. And I just want to um, say on this slide, some of these points might be um, representing one individual, so one adult or one larva, and others might be representing thousands of individuals. So just as an example, for the East Branch, East Branch of the Maple River, we have um, mark recapture data and we know there's a lot of animals here but um, this, this location might just be represented, this is the, the Boyne, one individual. And so this isn't giving a sense of status or number of individuals, just really trying to show distribution across, across its range. And then this map is showing those same point locations, but this time I've got the river names turned on. And I apologize, they're not really large. So I'm gonna go ahead and read them to you. Um, but the other thing to, to see on this map is I've got the Huck 10 watershed boundaries turned on to give you a sense of where in the watershed these, these records, these um, stream reaches are. So we have, this is the Carp Lake River, um, East Branch of the Maple River, Mullet Creek. Um, here we have Canada Creek, uh, Stewart Creek, East Branch of the Black River, and Van Helen or Van Hetten Creek, depending on your reference. And then um, North Branch of Boyne River here. And then we have the middle branch of Big Creek. And then finally, Portage Creek is our most recently discovered and also um, southernmost population. In terms of habitat for this species, they're found in streams with moderate to fast flow, um, good stream aeration, inorganic substrate and alkaline water conditions, and relatively cool temperatures. They're often found below beaver dams or natural debris dams or road stream crossings of um, culverts um, where they're found in the plunge pools below those structures, as well as in riffles and other well aerated um, parts of the stream. The hydrology seems to be important in that um, these are streams, they're seasonal streams that have some groundwater input. They don't dry up completely, but the water levels can um, drop considerably. And as the water levels drop, it exposes damp sand um, in the summer and the fall. And that damp sand is important for, is an important microhabitat for pupation. So the late instar larvae will actually crawl out of the stream and, and um, create a little burrow. And they actually pupate in that moist sand above the water line. Another important component of suitable habitat is the presence of algae. Um, they're found in association with Cara, Cladophora, and Dichotomous siphon. So if you see these uh, mats of algae, that, that's a sign of, of potential habitat, um, something to look for. And, and they, um, the Cara, Cladophora, and Dichotomous siphon serve as a food source for adults and larvae, as well as cover. If you're sampling from macroinvertebrates in streams that are known to be occupied by Hungerford's crawling water beetle. So if you're working in, in close proximity to those, those points on the map that I showed a few slides ago, um, 
it would be good for us to talk about your program and the activities you're conducting um, and whether a Federal Endangered Species Act permit might be required. And that's because it's reasonable that you might collect a, a, a Brickius, a, a, which is an endangered species. Um, so I'm gonna have my contact information in several slides in my presentation, and you can feel free to reach out to me and, and we can sort out you know, what you're doing and where and how close that is to a known occurrence and what that might mean in terms of a permit requirement. Everywhere else where um, there aren't, you know, we don't have a known occurrence of hungerfords, you don't need a, a Endangered Species Act permit, but we do ask that you notify us as soon as possible if you find uh, a hungerfords crawling water beetle. And we'll talk more about that um, in a couple of slides, how to identify them and what to do if you find one. So this is a, a species for which we have relatively little information, um, at least when compared to a lot of our other listed species in Michigan. Um, additional surveys are needed for us to better understand the extent of the species distribution. And there's reason to believe that they could be more widely distributed ac across the landscape um, than what we know of today. Um, and that's because the types of streams inhabited by Hungerford's pond water beetle do not appear to be rare. Um, in fact, streams similar to those that are occupied by the species are, are fairly common in northern Michigan and, and surrounding states. And most of, of the state has not had targeted surveys, um, which is where um, this presentation comes in. And hopefully you can help um, us to clarify the species distribution. So we would love for you to um, have this species in mind when you're, when you're um, identifying the macroinvertebrates and keep your eye out for Brickius in particular and, and Hungerford's pond water beetle. And as new sites are discovered, it helps us to accurately evaluate the species status. So to do that, um, I wanted to help you with what you're looking for. So on this slide, um, on the left, we have the three genera of the Holiplidae in North America. So we have Peltodites, Brickius, and Holiplus. And on the bottom right is the ventral view, which shows the, the hind coxal plates. So the Holiplidae um, are distinguished from other families within Coleoptera by these enlarged hind coxal plates um, shown here. The hind coxal plates, they meet along the midline and they cover the um, base of the hind legs. The hind coxal plates function to store air um, under the elytra. So that functions for respiration and buoyancy. In the upper right um, is Brickius hungerfordi. So that is um, Hungerford's crawling water beetle. And on this slide, I just wanted to mention that the only member of, of that genus in Michigan is the listed species. So if you have Brickius, in Michigan, you almost certainly have um, Brickius hungerfordi, the, the Hungerford's crawling water beetle. So once again, here are the, the Holiplidae. Um, we have Brickius on the right, this is Hungerford's crawling water beetle, and then we have um, Peltodites and Holiplus. And to, so to start, the, the, the takeaway for this whole presentation, what, I'm, what I'd really like for you to remember is, um, to identify Brickius and uh, to distinguish it from other members of the family, you're gonna look at the pronotum, which is this part of the, of the beetle. And you're looking at the basal two thirds of the pronotum and in Brickius, it's nearly parallel. In the other two, um, in Peltodites and Lipless, there's a much more pronounced angle to the base of the pronotum. So the, the base of the pronotum is much wider than it is closer to the head. And so again, so what you're looking for are, is this feature here. And if you have that, then congratulations, you have a really rare uh, species that you found and um, that's, that's great. If you want to, to key out Peltodites and Holiplus, there's um, some more information on this slide, but again, the take home message here is really um, to look for, for this, um, the Brickius features. Uh, here are the crawling water beetle larvae. Um, they have nine or 10 abdominal segments um, and the thoracic legs have five segments with, with the tarsal, um, the tarsi bearing one claw. The genus Peltodites shown in the upper left here have the dis these distinctive filaments coming off the dorsal surface. Um, Brickius and Holiplus do not have those filaments. 
But uh, again, the take home message for, for this presentation is the brachia larvae taper to a hooked tail. So you can see that here on the image on the right. And this is just a kind of a blow up of that. So this is what you're looking for in terms of brachius um, for the larvae. So we would love your help to try to help us better understand where the species occurs in Michigan. Um, it would be awesome if in a year, you know, we uh, folks that are on this, this call could um, help us identify new populations if they exist where you're, where you're doing your sampling. But even if not, um, it would be great to have negative survey data too. If we know that folks are looking for this, this rare species and not finding it, that's useful information to us as well. So since you're already out there looking for macroinvertebrates, um, if, if you can help us by, by taking a closer look and trying to identify brickiest, that would be really helpful for us. Again, if you work in streams where hunger birds is known to occur, or if you're not sure, uh, feel free to reach out to me and my contact information is here in the purple box. And we can talk about you know, what you're doing and where and whether a permit might be a good idea. And then the other thing to do is if, if you're willing, it would be awesome if you could look through your collections and identify helipwids um, to genus. So looking for that, um, the basal two thirds of the pronotum. And if you find a hunger birds in your collection, just let us know. Um, this has happened several times where someone tur turned out they inadvertently collected a hunger birds crawling water beetle. And so they contacted us, they let us know where the animal was collected and when, and um, provided us with some photographs to help verify. The other thing is, you know, obviously when you're sampling, if you can keep your eye out for hunger birds calling water beetle um, and let us know if you find a new record. Ideally, if you could um, identify them before collecting them and then um, just photo documenting and releasing them back to the site of capture, that would be best. But if you do inadvertently collect one, um, again, we just ask that you periodically, you know, check to see if you have any um, hunger birds calling water beetles in your collection. And if you do, let us know right away, send us a photo um, and the location and information from the collection site. This is a, this picture on this slide is, was just taken with a cell phone. So a lot of cell phones now have high enough resolution where you can just send us a, a video or a, a cell phone picture and we can help to verify the, the species identification if that's needed. And then finally, um, on this slide, we have some, a, a URL that, that has some more information on hunger birds calling water beetle. If you go to this, this um, site, you can scroll down to the recovery section, and there is a five-year review status, a five-year status review document there that has the maps I showed today, as, long, as well as some additional information that might be helpful on this particular species. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me or, um, I think after Emily's presentation, we'll have some time to answer questions as well. And with that, I'm going to try to stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Carrie. That was great. Uh, those of us who really are into bug ID, that was a lot of fun to see those pictures and such. So thank you so much. Um, Emily, if you want to try to share your screen. I can see your screen now. Let's test the audio a little bit again, though. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yep. Before it was a little laggy. Right. It sounds fine now. Okay, just interrupt me if it gets like that, um, and I'll turn off my video so that hopefully that could help with the audio. Okay, thanks. Um, right. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Emily Burke. I'm with Grass River Natural Area. Um, so today I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about um, just New Zealand mud snail basics, how to identify this relatively new invasive species. Um, but then I'm also um, going to tell you the story of how we found them in our um, volunteer stream monitoring program um, and sort of what happened after that. Okay. Um, so to get you oriented, we are located um, in Northwest Lower Michigan, sort of just 45 minutes Northeast of Traverse City. 
Um, Grass River itself, you can see right here on this map, um, it's part of a larger watershed called the Elk River Chain of Lakes, which is just a chain of lakes and um, interconnected rivers. The water flows um, out to Grand Travers Bay um, right here at Elk Rapids. And Grass River itself is in right in the middle of the chain of lakes. It's two and a half miles long and it's pretty slow moving and warm watered. Um, the unique thing about it, though, is that it is surrounded by Grass River Natural Area, which on the right hand map here you can see um, is in the light green color. Um, so as opposed to the rest of the landscape surrounding the chain of lakes, which is characterized by a lot of summer cottages um, and some agriculture, um, it, this is a relatively pristine um, and intact ecosystem. So this is sort of what it looks like. This is just a stretch of the river, but it looks like this for most of um, its length. And this is an aerial photo um, of the river also flowing from north here toward sort of towards southwest here. Um, and you can see that this is really intact, nice rich conifer swamp and northern wet meadow, um, as opposed to relatively highly fragmented sections um, of the landscape surrounding it. So our stream monitoring program began in 2013 with a grant from my course. So we're always grateful for that funding. Um, we monitor not the Grass River itself, but the three cold water tributaries that flow into the Grass River. So that's Finch Creek. Um, you can see the four sites of Finch Creek right here. Um, this purple is just um, denoting the Grass River natural area. So we have some sites that are within the natural area and some that are upstream of it. Uh, we also monitor four sites on Cold Creek and then three sites on Shanty Creek. Um, and we're a small enough operation that we only monitor one stream um, each year. So we'll do a monitoring in the spring and fall. Like this year, we monitored all, the, all of our sites on Shanty Creek. The year before, we did all of our sites on Cold Creek in the spring and fall. The year before, all the sites on Finch Creek. And now next year, we'll go back to Finch Creek. Um, so what I like to somewhat affectionately refer to as doomsday, uh, happened this spring. Um, my coworker and I were just out doing standard monitoring, just our spring sampling event for our stream monitoring program. We were at the site, um, where Shanty Creek flows into Grass River. So at the mouth of Shanty Creek right here. Um, and he was in the water doing the collection and I was sort of picking up some woody debris and I noticed all of these snails on this woody debris. And thankfully I had actually just attended a virtual training on New Zealand mud snails um, that was put together by Trout Unlimited and our local SISMA. Um, so I knew that what I was looking at were probably um, mud snails. And I knew that they had never been found in the Chain of Lakes watershed before. Um, so that, this is sort of my first recommendation for, I'm going to have, I have like four recommendations for people that also administer, um, st volunteer stream monitoring programs throughout my talk. This is the first one is make sure that you're the people that are doing your monitoring, but especially the people that are doing your identifications. If those people are different than the people that are actually collecting your samples, make sure they know how to identify New Zealand mud snails. Um, because, you know, if I hadn't known what to look for, I probably would have just categorized these as sn general snails, and um, that would have been that. So this is sort of a good time to take a break from the story part of my talk and talk about how to identify these snails. So the first thing is that they're really small. Um, at full grown, they're really only about an eighth of an inch long, so think like the size of a grain of rice. You can see up here, this photo with the penny um, is giving you some sense of scale there. Um, the other thing is that when you have the shell pointed um, up and, and the opening toward you, the opening should be on the right side. Um, and the shell is relatively pointy. It's not very rounded. It's pretty pointed at the top, which is another good indicator. Uh, and then they have five to six on average whirls or spirals on the shell. Um, and for what it's worth, they can live in a variety of different habitats, but we found them um, mostly on large woody debris in the stream. 
Um, so a little bit about the New Zealand mud snail invasion. Obviously, they're native to New Zealand um, and also New Zealand's surrounding islands. Um, they live in freshwater lakes, rivers, and streams, so a wide variety of water bodies. Um, they've since spread to several different parts of the world, including Europe, um, but they were first detected in the U.S. in 1987 in the Snake River of Idaho. They've since spread to a lot of different parts of the West. Um, we didn't see them in the Great Lakes region until 1991. Um, and we really didn't see them, or they weren't reported, I should say, um, from inland water bodies in Michigan, like our inland rivers, until 2015. Um, and at that point, they were reported from the Pure Marquette River down here. And since then, we now know that they exist in six different watersheds, the Pure Marquette, uh, the Pine River, the Upper Manistee, Boardman, the Osable, and then just recently um, because of our detection in the Shanty Creek Grass River area. So more about the ecological impacts of New Zealand mud snails. Um, Joe Noner mentioned this um, in the talk this morning that this is still a really active area of research, um, especially in the Great Lakes region. Um, but the studies that have been done, they do suggest that New Zealand mud snails, if they don't always, they at least have a high potential to outcompete native macroinvertebrates. Um, and they also have the potential to alter nutrient cycling and trophic energy transfer. And what I mean by this is uh, these snails can reach densities of up to 500,000 per square meter, which is even hard to imagine, it's mind boggling. Um, but because they can reach such high densities, one, they can completely eat everything um, in that area, they eat mostly detritus or um, other sort of like decaying plant and animal material. Um, but two, because they are sort of gobbling up all of the primary productivity in the stream, um, then when fish eat them, and fish will often turn to eating these snails because one, some of the most of the macroinvertebrates in the stream have been outcompeted by them, um, which is you know their normal food or sometimes the fish just ingest them accidentally, especially when they reach such high densities. Um, but these snails often survive digestion through the fish's gut and they come out totally unharmed because they have such a like beefy shell um, that the fish aren't gaining any nutrition from them. And so while the fish will feel full from consuming them, they, they're not getting any nutrients or any calories. And so these snails are sort of like a roadblock or a dead end to energy being transferred up the food system or the, the food chain, um, which obviously has negative effects for the fish health um, in fish that have been, that have consumed and do consume New Zealand mud snails. They often have lower body condition than those fish that don't. Um, and just a note about these ecological impacts is that there's no effective control methods um, for these snails. Once they get into a water body, there's not much you can do to get rid of them, um, which makes these ecological impacts sort of compounded on each other. Oh, and I should say before moving on, a lot of these impacts um, are very density dependent. So in areas where the snails do reach those incredibly high densities, you know, it's obviously more likely that you're going to see some of these effects and that the severity of these effects will be magnified than if you see relatively low densities of these snails. Okay, which brings us to spread. How are they spread? Um, and it's mostly via recreation, um, at, least, at least how they're spread between rivers in Michigan. So they'll attach themselves to the bottom of kayaks or boats. Um, or especially the bottoms of fishing waders, they get really stuck in that tread on the bottom of the boots. And then um, when that equipment is brought to uh, water bodies that haven't been infested or invaded with these New Zealand mud snails yet, um, those snails then can create a new population in those new areas. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, they can also be spread throughout a watershed um, in the guts of fish as the fish move um, through the watershed. Okay, um, so back to the story here. So we found them, 
Um, so what we did is I preserved quite a few of them in ethanol, just um, based on the suspicion that they were New Zealand mud snails. We decontaminated all of our gear to within an inch of its life, which I'll talk more about how to decontaminate um, your gear later. Uh, because I had um, been in that, it's like, <laughs> uh, because I had been in, oops, go back. Um, that virtual training, I knew who to contact um, when we did I, or detect these snails. Um, so it's a group of, it's sort of a collaboration um, of folks from different state agencies, um, also Trout Unlimited and Oakland University has a lab called the Aquatic Ecology Lab. Um, that's been a great resource for us. So I contacted all these people, I sent them photos of what we had found. And then my favorite part about this whole thing, because I love puns, is that I got to send some snails via snail mail um, to the Aquatic Ecology Lab at Oakland University so that they could do um, essentially genetic testing on them to confirm that they were in fact New Zealand mud snails. So that all happened in May right after we found the snails. Um, so then while we're still waiting for the results of um, the tests to come back. We, you know, we're not sure if they are New Zealand mud snails, but um, based on the physical characteristics of the snails, um, everybody in this group has sort of, uh, is, we're all like 95% sure that what we're looking at is mud snails. So um, folks from the state agencies and Trout Unlimited and Oakland University launched an eDNA sampling effort um, really quickly within a few weeks after our detection. Um, so all of these green stars represent areas that they took water samples um, throughout the chain of lakes at and basically looking for DNA that the mud snails had shed into the water. Um, they didn't find any evidence of any mud snail DNA um, except at where we actually located the snails at the mouth of Shanty Creek. Um, but there was some question about how sensitive those results are, because if the snails are existing in really low densities, maybe they're not shedding enough DNA to be picked up in all of the eDNA samples. Um, so we also, another thing we did is we reviewed all of our preserved samples that we had previously collected, um, all of our macroinvertebrate samples from, you know, years past. And that's my second recommendation for, um, for you if you are um, a coordinator of a volunteer stream monitoring program is that if you have the space, um, keep your samples. I know Paul always recommends keeping them for five years, but we had kept ours since the beginning of um, our, our monitoring um, efforts, which we have a pretty small program, so it didn't take too much space, but that was really helpful to be able to go back through our old samples and looking for New Zealand mud snails to see if we had missed any. Um, and we actually, did find that in both the spring of 2018 and the spring of 2020 or the spring and the fall of 2018 which was the last time we had monitored Shanty Creek because again we only monitor them once every three years um, we did find a couple mud snails in those samples which means that um, the mud snails were probably introduced sometime before 2018 um, and we just unfortunately didn't know what we were looking for back then. Um, so we also notified our local partners, um, and again, you know, we didn't have confirmation that these were mud snails yet, but just giving everybody a heads up, um, everybody else that does water quality monitoring in the region. All right, after detection part two, once we finally um, received confirmation in August that they were in fact New Zealand mud snails, which we had all suspected, uh, this sort of launched an outreach campaign and um, again, we depended on our local partners. We've got a pretty robust um, group of folks working on water quality in the chain of lakes. So a lot of groups put out um, articles in their e-newsletters or their membership bulletins um, saying that, you know, the snails have been detected and what to do um, to prevent their spread. The DNR also put out a press release. Um, we, um, on a more local scale, did a bunch of little TV interviews and newspaper articles with local media. Um, and right now we're working on getting signage at access points, um, especially ones that are really close to the Grass River. But um, 
in the future, hopefully throughout the chain of lakes um, that say New Zealand mud snails have been detected in these waters um, and how to decontaminate. We also, um, and this is my third recommendation for groups that do stream monitoring, um, is we integrated visual New Zealand mud snail surveys into our stream monitoring efforts starting this fall. And so it's just an additional 20 minute survey um, that you do when you are out collecting for mac collecting macroinvertebrates or um, collecting habitat data. It's really simple. You just have two people start at the center point of your stretch of stream that you're monitoring. Um, and they walk in opposite directions, literally just visually searching for mud snails. Um, and if you find any or any anything that you suspect to be a mud snail, um, you can collect it and preserve it in ethanol and then contact the correct people. Um, so we actually started that this fall and we did find just a very few um, New Zealand mud snails at our uppermost site on Shady Creek. So now we know that they're not just at the mouth of Shaney Creek, but also at our uppermost site. Um, another thing we're doing is strangely because the snails that we found don't look like the snails that are um, that ha that inhabit the rest of inland Michigan. Um, that that clone because the snails reproduce mostly asexually, so they're all sort of identical to each other. That clone is referred to as the Asabo clone. Um, and apparently our, the snails we collected don't visually, or the phenotypes look slightly different um, in that ours are darker and the shells are a little bit more bulbous. And so that begs the question, well, if maybe they didn't come from a nearby stream um, in Michigan, maybe they came from some, maybe they were introduced from somewhere else. So uh, our, the lab that we've been working with at Oakland University sent um, a sample of our snails over to Switzerland um, where they have a colleague who is really skilled in this genotyping and can figure out for us where the snails came from so that we can hopefully um, nip any future introductions from that source, nip them in the bud before, before they um, get spread. And then lastly, what we're doing um, is we, uh, we just wrote a letter of support for Oakland University who just applied for a Michigan Invasive Species Program grant to do more really in-depth surveys um, across the state to map the distribution of New Zealand mud snails. Um, and specifically, they want to focus on doing a lot of surveys in the Elk River Chain of Lakes and also the Osable um, to really figure out you know, how widespread they are in those systems. Okay, so this is, I think the second to last slide. Um, so what do we do now besides um, just really focusing on getting the word out about um, preventing their spread is we've been focusing a lot on de decontamination. And this is my fourth and final recommendation for people. Um, if you aren't already, if you don't already have procedures in place for decontaminating your gear after you're out monitoring at a site, um, you really should because this works not just for decontaminating um, and preventing the spread of New Zealand mud snails, but all other aquatic invasive species too. Um, so basically what you do is you just get out and you stomp your waders off and remove any debris from any of your equipment that's been in the water. And then you use just like a stiff bristled brush and you brush off any like excess muck or mud. Um, and then you just spray down your gear with um, a, either a solution of deleted bleach or for New Zealand mud snails, I know that formula 409 is also 100% effective, oddly. Um, so either one of those um, away from the water body um, and then you let it sit for 10 to 20 minutes, then you rinse it off with tap water also in a spray bottle and then you let it dry. Um, so it's really easy, but it does go a long way to preventing the spread of these things, especially those tiny, um, aquatic invasive species like New Zealand mud snails that it's really hard to physically see them um, and therefore it's really easy to spread them. So uh, a great resource for this decontamination um, procedure but also just any general New Zealand mud snail info is this New Zealand mud snail collaborative website down here um, that has been really helpful for our group. Okay, how am I doing on time? All right, I gotta hurry up. Um, so this last slide uh, is just, you know, gets at the big question. We'll have 
these this new has this New Zealand mud snail invasion affected our macroinvertebrate scores? And the short answer is not really, but it's probably too soon to tell. Um, so we've got our three sites here. <clears throat> On the left is the site um, at the mouth of Shannon Creek where we first found New Zealand mud snails. Um, again, looking back at our previous samples, probably found they probably were introduced sometime between 2015 and 2018. So that's um, indicated by this red line. This middle stretch, um, we have not found them. And then the uppermost stretch, we found them just this fall. Uh, and then on the left axis here, we have just the old MyCore scoring system. And so you can see that the scores do, um, they go up and down, you know, they oscillate, but not in any clear direction yet. Um, but this is definitely something we're gonna be keeping an eye on. All right. That's all I got. So I think Carrie and I are happy to take questions now. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, I don't have any in the chat box yet. Um, we have three official minutes and then luckily we're going into a break. So um, we can go into that break a little bit by a few minutes if we need to. So if anybody has any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in. Uh, Paul just said, good job. It was really interesting. I am too. I was like both of you, I was just like so <laughs> interested, so great. They were both so interesting and are both great storytellers, I guess. So uh, thank you so very much for um, presenting today. All right, here's one. How long can the New Zealand mud snail live outside of the water if you don't clean your gear or whatever? Yeah, that's a good question. So I've read up to two weeks which is a long time. They can really close that operculum off and just like they're super hardy. Um, so yeah, I mean, I know just personally, I've become a lot more cognizant of it because I kayak a lot in the Boardman River near where I live. And then sometimes I take my kayak to work. Um, and yeah, just really spraying down your gear with 409 or diluted bleach solution is, yeah, a good idea. Um. Let's see, how long does your decontamination process take for a team of volunteers? That's a good question. Yeah, so I don't, I don't find that it takes any more than really 15 minutes. You do have that 10 minute waiting period, at least 10 minute waiting period after you spray um, your gear. So what I do, what, what I did in the fall and what seemed to work well is we started the decontamination process, sprayed all of our gear, and then we sort of looked at our data sheet and filled in any gaps of stuff that we hadn't collected, like any habitat data, any questions we had. Um, and then we finished the decontamination process once that waiting period was done. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alex Florian, um, said that the scores do look more varied at the site with the New Zealand mud snail than the other sites. Do you think that's because the New Zealand mud snail has no predation pressure? It has a more like boom and bust cycle. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. They definitely might. And I know that um, Lucas Nathan at the DNR, who's one of the um, people that we've been working with on this, commented that just from our photos and from the samples we've sent, um, there definitely are different age classes, which you know suggests that the population's been there a long time and could definitely be going through these boom and bust cycles. Um, I also, I see, I'm not an expert on this, but I also recall him saying um, that the populations either increase or decrease in the spring um, because different water levels have something to do um, with the population cycling but I, I can't remember exactly what that cause was, but yeah, I think that there definitely is some cyclical action going on with the population. Great. Um, somebody wanted to know about freezing your gear for decon for stuff that's feasible like waders. Yeah, un unfortunately I don't really, I'm not familiar with that. I know that that is sort of an option for decontamination, but I've always heard, and I know that Paul recommends doing the whole brush and spray down situation. Yeah. That's what we do here too um, at cool. Eagle. But um, I, 
I don't know about the freezer thing. I'll have to ask one of our AIS staff about that. Um, let me see. I think that might, that might, but yeah, I have one quick question, Emily. Do you go down to family level? With we your- don't. We don't. Yeah. Um, so, and it's funny, we have sort of an interesting um, structure to how we do identifications. Our, all of our identifications are done by two retired entomologists from MSU, um, which, yeah, so they mostly do order, but which I would probably guess is why we missed the mud snails at first back in 2018 is because our identifiers are really bug experts, but maybe, you know, not snail experts. And also it's so early on in the invasion in the state that I don't think it was like really, uh, you know, people didn't know about it. So. Right. Um, I'm curious because uh, if New Zealand mud snails are infect- affecting the macroinvertebrates, um, family level ID just might be more helpful in some ways to see if some populations are falling out. And same with Carrie, if, um, identifying the beetle going to family level would help with that as well. So just a plug for family level. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I do oh, hope to get there. Yeah. Uh, well, it's time for a break, but again, Carrie and Emily, thank you so much for your presentations and everyone uh, make sure you contact either one of them if you have questions. I'm excited that next year to see if uh, maybe we come, the micro, um, my core groups come up with the beetle or the New Zealand mud snail. It'll be interesting to see if we can report back on that next year. All right, everyone, a 15 minute break till 2.45 um, where we'll have the last of the breakouts. Thanks a lot. Thank you.